To open your Bibles with me this evening to Paul's letter to Titus. Paul's letter to Titus. We're going to read chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Our focus will be verses 6, 7, and 8. But we want to see the context into which Paul spoke to Titus, and thereby Christ spoke to his churches. If you would please stand with me. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 through verse 10. This is the word, the almighty, infallible, inspired word of God. May Christ, our intercessor, plead for us and send the Spirit to give us great light. Verse 1, chapter 2. These are God's words. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Holy Christ, head of the church, our prophet, our priest, and our king, send the power of thy spirit to encourage, strengthen, invigorate thy people here this evening. May thy words come with power and may every heart be kindled to great love for thee. Speak, Lord, thy servants hear thee. Open thou thy word and teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Following the news of the tragic fall of a well-known Christian pastor and preacher, let us carefully consider the sacred text before us. We have heard the news. Our hearts are broken. Our minds stagger. And yet it is reality. Paul commands Titus to preach sound doctrine in order to produce godly manhood and virtuous womanhood in older and younger men and women. Preach about being men and women. Why would we have to be told that? Because Satan 
and sin perverts everything God has done. That is his work. Christ, the head of the church, wants the lives of his people to be in harmony with their doctrine. Nevertheless, the men and women that Titus was to exhort were not the only ones that were to maintain godly living. Paul commands Titus to manifest a pattern of good works. Hear that again. Under the head of the church, in the power of the Spirit, the Apostle Paul says to Titus, the one who has labored with him, a son in the faith, he says, I want your life to be a pattern of good works. As the representative of Christ and Paul, Titus was to identify and ordain elders in every city and to silence false teachers because one, false doctrine at best cannot produce the holy living God requires. Without holiness, no man will see God. And number two, false doctrine at its worst damns the soul. Paul said to the false teachers, or said of the false teachers, listen carefully. They profess that they know God. But in works, they deny Him. Now, what does that mean? They have mouth religion, but their life tells the truth about what they are. It's not your mouth and profession. It is the profession and testimony of God's grace in your life. Words will not stand in the day of judgment. Not words alone. Naked words. They profess to know God. But in works they deny Him. Being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Notice the focus on good works. Paul followed this with an, a striking contrast between the false teachers and Titus. He takes that young man, so to speak, and he says this, But speak thou, the but is what we call an adversative. Here are the false teachers. An adverse to that is Titus. He says, but speak thou, Titus, the things which become sound doctrine. Now, <clears throat> we may read the word become there the wrong way, as I did the first few years I read it, till I did a little further study. The idea of become there does, it, does not mean turn into sound doctrine. That's not the idea. He's being told to speak things which are consistent with sound doctrine. What doctrine would that be? The doctrine that Paul taught him as the apostle to the Gentiles. Speak thou the things that are fitting. Speak thou the things that are in accord with sound, healthy doctrine. In verses 7 and 8, Paul returns to focus again on Titus' life. Paul knew that the lost souls of the Greco-Roman citizens of Crete were carefully watching Christians and their leaders. He therefore wanted Titus' doctrine and life to be above reproach. Right doctrine and right living. They're distinct, but never to be separated, ever. Now with this in mind, our message is entitled, A Pattern of Good Works. May God, our Heavenly Father, graciously grant us the light, power, and presence of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ and for the good of our own souls. Amen. Our first thought is this. Titus was a model, or was to model, good works. First half of verse 7. 
After commanding Titus to exhort young men to be sober-minded, interesting that he only says one thing to the young men. Be sober-minded. They tend to act as fools till the Lord and good fathers help them to think. Be sober-minded. So then he exhorts Titus, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. Now that's a staggering command. In everything, show good works. Paul wanted Titus to be a living example of the transforming grace of God in every aspect of his life. Why? Because every Christian should do the same. And that's what the leaders are to teach them. The leaders aren't simply men who have been uh, down the road just a little bit further. They're to be men who've been equipped by God to walk in the faith and then call God's people to live that way. Well, I don't agree with him. Well, keep studying. <clears throat> he might be wrong. But the fact of the matter is the Lord has put him here to say this is what God is calling us to. It's not up for a vote. Where do we be Berean? Examine? If we find that to be true, we should be giving ourselves to wholehearted living it. Not because of the elder, not because of the pastor, but because of God's word. Now, Paul knew that God's truth, enlightened and empowered by God's spirit, transforms God's people. There's no power in the elder in and of himself. It's God's word and God's spirit. Paul also knew this simple fact. Because of their sinful nature, human beings despise authority. Especially hypocritical authority. When a person in authority does not live the kind of life that he or she requires of others, no one takes that person seriously. We learn both by hearing instruction and by observing others, right? Hearing instruction and by observing others. We all are living and learning all the time. Children are little sponges. They're taking up everything they hear. Parents are imprinting their habits on the children every day. And they're good ones or they're not. And many of them will drag what they've seen right up into their own marriages. It needs to be in accord with God's word as much as humanly possible. Now, for that very reason, hearing instruction, observing others, Paul wanted Titus to be an example of the life that obedience to sound doctrine produces. Here's the truth. Walk in it. Live in it. As Abraham walked around in the promised land before God had led his seed to come there. He walked around and looked in the land. Mm -mm. We need to take that word when it's set before us and walk around in it. Learn it. What does it mean for me and how should I live in the light of that? Or is it just mm, sermon 476? <clears throat> Titus must therefore show himself a pattern of good works. There needs to be the doctrine that he's been preaching to the people. And then it needs to be enfleshed. Now the word pattern comes from the, an original Greek word, or in the original Greek, meant a mark made 
as a result of a blow or pressure. A mark made as a result of a blow or pressure. So it obviously points to an impression. We may say of someone, oh, he or she left a powerful impression upon me. That's the idea. Obviously, <clears throat> our lives leave impressions on others. Do they not? And very often, when people don't even notice, they are often leaving powerful impressions that they're unaware of. You never know how you are affecting another person. So this idea, this pattern here came to mean a model of behavior as an example to be imitated. A modern, a, a model of behavior and an example to be imitated or even an example to be avoided. Titus then was to be an example for the believers of Crete to follow. Titus was to be an example of that glorious doctrine of life in Christ to these pagans. And he was to show them what it meant to walk with Christ. It's not like, oh, um, leave it to the pastor. It comes from God from the word to your heart for you to live. It's not just for mm, the elders. The elders are to be leading the way in the way Christians live. <clears throat> That's a burden almost impossible to bear because we know what we are. And yet we've been called to the same thing that Titus was. That is why the fall of an elder, a pastor, is so bewildering, so heartbreaking, so frightening to any thinking Christian. Those who lead God's people must live a godly life that demonstrates and authenticates their doctrine demonstrates and authenticates their doctrine. The false teachers on the Isle of Crete were living in a way that denied the transforming power of God's gospel of grace in Jesus Christ. They were apparently like those Pharisees of whom Jesus warned, Do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. They say and do not. There are many that profess to be Christians <clears throat> who appear to have no more than say. And they do not. <clears throat> this is what Paul meant when he said, they, the false creatures, are the false teachers of Crete, profess that they know God. They had mouth religion. Mouth religion is powerful. They said, they professed that they knew the living God. Yet in works, <clears throat> it doesn't say they failed a little bit. It says in their works they denied him. In works, they were abominable disobedient, and unto every good work, reprobate. They had lots of work, lots of religious works. And to people who didn't know the truth clearly, powerfully, the things they were saying sounded good. They were getting followers. As we read earlier, they were overturning whole households who had come to profess Christ. But now they were walking in a different doctrine. It wasn't Christ's doctrine. And their lives were showing it. 
Friends, the word abominable here means things that stir up feelings of repugnance. That's how God saw them. Repugnant. Abhorrent. Detestable. Their mouths proclaimed one thing, but their lives shouted another. <clears throat> another way of putting this is that their lips said, I know God, while their lives testified, I do not know God. Now, only those who know God can recognize that. That's why Titus was there. That's exactly why Paul left him there on Crete to undo the terrible apostasy that was spreading through the churches. <clears throat> Titus then was to be a model of good work so that elders, deacons, and all believers would learn to do the same. Good works in the name of Jesus Christ, by faith in Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, according to the word that was given them. So, Titus was to be a model. <clears throat> and he was to model good works. Secondly, Titus was to model sound doctrine. This is the second part of verse 7. In direct contrast to the false teachers, Paul addresses Titus and his doctrine in the second part of that verse. <clears throat> First, Paul said to Titus that he was to show uncorruptness. Now today we would say incorrupt. But uncorruptness. Uncorruptness. The word Paul used here means genuineness. Integrity. <clears throat> Does that mean that Titus was to show integrity in the content of his preaching? Or in the matter? The manner of that which he preached? Well... Commentators are almost evenly divided on that. You can choose which one you think. I would normally come to the conclusion, and I do, that when commentators are lined up on two different views, but that the views are in harmony, it probably means both things. How he preached and the content of what he preached. <clears throat> commentators always give us challenges they help us they challenge us but <clears throat> Paul also wanted Titus to show gravity in his teaching gravity here means behavior which is befitting befitting the circumstance what's the circumstance a man is delivering God's word it's not a clown show it's not a movie it's not a play. It is the living, holy, transforming, pure word of God. And men should give their hearts. Women, children should listen. When those weak vessels of dust get up there and say, Thus saith the Lord. The authority is in the words that God has given. And they're to be heard. We are to do our best in attempting to explain and apply those words. No one does it perfectly. But gravity also carries the idea of dignity that leads to respect. You hear it. It should be delivered so that people understand the weight of what you're saying. And it should be delivered in a respectful way. And it should be received respectfully. There is seriousness in it. And in our day, people don't want seriousness. They want funny. They want comedians in the pulpit. They want people that aren't too serious because serious bothers us. 
We don't want people to be too serious. Let's get over the somber face, guys. Okay, this is not a funeral. Can't we have a little fun here? We're not here for fun. We're here to hear, H-E-R, God. And that's sobering. While Paul was not commanding Titus to an unnatural, long-faced demeanor, he was commanding him to be sober in his preaching. Brethren, what is more important than the matters of eternal life and eternal damnation? What is more serious in the world in existence than souls that can be lost forever. It doesn't mean that when we're sitting and talking, and it doesn't even mean that sometimes within the context of preaching as we're attempting to make a point, that we might say something that's more lighthearted, but who can take a stand-up comedian preacher, as I grew up seeing, seriously? I repeat, it's not a clown show. It's not entertainment. We're not here to joke and yuck it up. We're here to find out how to walk in a holy life. In a life that brings glory to God who spilled the blood of his son on Calvary's cross, that we might walk in holiness. I grew up hearing these guys that would get up there, especially if they were so-called supposed to be fellows that could evangelize young people. And they were all the same. Jokes, get everybody laughing, then they bring in the hell part. I mean, I just thought it was the weirdest show ever. We're laughing, everybody's rolling, and then he brings up hell. If he ever got to that part, very often it was just give your life to Jesus, give your heart to Jesus. Giving your heart to Jesus, by the way is not to be found in Scripture as a call in an evangelistic gospel preaching meeting. You don't have anything to offer God. He's not interested in the cesspool in you. Why is our country in the trouble that it's in? The pulpits. It's not, oh, no, the transgender ideology, the LGBT, the drugs, fentanyl, oh, immigration. All these things are the signs of a crumbling civilization and God's judgment. Why? It's quite obvious for those who have eyes to see. The pulpits are not preaching what Paul told Titus to preach. We're in a war and we need to preach like it. Doesn't mean there isn't joy. Of course there is. But it does mean we're very often wanting nothing but grinning rather than weeping over the foulness of our sins. Paul wanted Titus to manifest sincerity. Again, the word Paul here uses means a purity. He is to preach and to deliver the word and to live in a sincere manner. That whatever else you may think about the fellow, you know he means it. He means it. And when you see him in or out of the pulpit, he means what he's talking about. Finally, Titus was to use sound speech that cannot be condemned. What human being can do that without the power of the Holy Spirit? Once again, we have a question. Does sound speech mean integrity of doctrine, as some understand it, or to the manner in which Titus preaches it? 
or to the way he spoke in and out of the pulpit. Calvin leans to the last choice, Titus' speech in and out of the pulpit. Yet, who of us, if we took those three different views and thought about it carefully, uh, who would argue with any of those positions? It's important. Sound speech means integrity of doctrine. There's no question about that. God's words need to be purely preached as much as weak and fallible men can bring them. That is why they always need the power of the Holy Spirit to the manner in which Titus preached. Or just the way he spoke in and out of the pulpit. Surely, the man of God must manifest integrity in the content, in the manner, and the motive of his ministry of the word. This is what Paul is commanding Titus, and Titus is to preach to God's people. Why? So that the people will live those ways too. In the church that my mom brought me to when I was younger, I never got the idea from the pastor that he was telling us how to live. Every week he was trying to get somebody to let go of the pew to come down the aisle and get saved. Now, whether we agree with that particular procedure or not, what happens when that's the focus all the time inside the church you starve the sheep. You starve those who are hungry to be taught the word of God. And every week they're just hearing one more way of saying, let go of that pew and come down here and make a decision. It's a machine. It's more calculated to produce goats, not sheep. So Titus... <clears throat> had a, an incredible task set before him. He was to call sinners to repent of their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why all three of those choices of what that means to have integrity in his speech matter. He was to call sinners to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus he had to clearly distinguish holy living from worldly wickedness. He must plainly declare the gospel, justification by faith alone, in Christ alone. And sanctification, that is holy living. And to do so in the power of the Holy Spirit. He had to describe the depravity of sin and the horrors of hell as well as the sweetness of the gospel and the glories of heaven. He had to expose the God-hating abominations of his culture and to promote the Christ-honoring purity of life in the kingdom of God. Titus was to be a model of sound doctrine. But what do you do then when you fail at your good works? What do, you, what do you do when you fail, when you sin? Should you just fall into oppression? Oh, I didn't do enough good works today. Now, that's a, a serious thought to have. But what do we do? Uh, should a life like this simply drive us deeply into introspection and to leave us just depressed all the time because we weren't perfect today? No. No. We'll let J.C. Ryle answer this. He said, Awful as the right view of sin undoubtedly is, no one need faint or despair if he will take a right view of Jesus Christ at the same time. And that's the kind of balance that we constantly need to set before God's people. Sin is dreadful. You should hate it when you sin. 
But don't stay in some state of depression. Run to Christ. Get to Christ. Go to the Christ you went to the day you repented and believed on him. And be cleansed. We've got to have those two things in a proper balance. Now, Ryle is, I think Ryle is right. Well, number three, Titus and Paul's reason for good works. What was the reason for all this? It's in here in verse 8. Paul wanted Titus to manifest good works and sound doctrine so that he that is of the contrary part, that's the false teachers, and we could even throw in there just people that disagree. The false teachers and those that believe them, and there were plenty of those, they were clearly pulling away people from the gospel. Titus's life was to shine forth the integrity of service that Jesus, that Jesus modeled for us. And he wanted, Paul wanted Titus's life to stand in stark contrast, light darkness, not a bunch of gray in the middle, light darkness <clears throat> against the money-grubbing, disobedient, fraudulent lives of the false teachers on the Isle of Crete. And the stamp of authenticity for Titus was a pattern of good works. Sound doctrine lived out. Sound doctrine lived out. Let us now make a few applications. <clears throat> Just have three. But we want to think a little bit about them. <clears throat> First of all, let's consider the definition and nature of good works. What is this thing that he's being commanded to? What are good works? The pastoral epistles teach us much about Paul's thinking near the end of his life. These three letters, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, uh, <clears throat> were probably the last things that he wrote. Therefore, the pattern found in all three represents his mature thinking. And the phrase that comes up over again and again, is good works. The other one was self-control. Self-control and good works. If you have a good grasp of that, your life is, is getting into the right path. Self-control. I remember sitting in the house of a woman who had married a pastor's son. They were friends of Myra's and me, or of Myra's and mine. <clears throat> and she did something, and she was kind of throwing a snit in the kitchen, and she caught herself. And she said, oh, I just have a, I just have a bad temper. <laughs> I, I'm just going to be like that until the rapture. That's a denial of the gospel. Everybody on board? What that means is, well, I'm just not going to put it to death. Uh, that's not going to work. That's not a healthy life. That's a denial that Jesus has saved me from my sins. All it says is, I'm glad he's taken care of the debt. But it's not saying anything about me mortifying it and that's what we're called to do finally my brethren says Paul we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh for if ye live after the flesh ye shall die but if we we through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body we shall live she should have said I just failed, and I showed the temper I've had since I was a child. But pray for me. I'm doing what I can to mortify this. Don't use grace as an excuse to go on in a pattern that you know dishonors God. You control that mouth. You control the, those thoughts. 
Even when they land, you don't have to let them build their nest there. Fight them with the Word of God, with the Spirit, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a warfare. The words put on the whole armor of God are nonsense if you don't understand how to walk in that armor and how to use that sword. It's just nice Bible words that mean nothing. Now, all the Bible words are ultimately to show us how to walk, how to live, how to glorify Christ. Stop using grace to hide the fact that you're not mortifying that sin. Go after it in the presence of Jesus with the power of the Spirit, the glory of His Word, and get it. And stay with it till that thing lies down. It may take you a long time. Sometimes the Lord delivers us from something right away. Sometimes we fight things for years. But make sure you're in the fight. That's the deal. It isn't just like, oh, smooth words. Just roll over me. Believing God's truth and applying it to our lives will give birth to the precious and sweet fruit of godly living. Paul's command once again to Titus, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. One of Satan's tricks is to say, in an area where we're not having to fight too much, that we have that under control. And that here are what my problems are. No, you need Jesus in every single aspect of your life. You need him in absolutely everything you think and do. Because if, not, if you're not, you're cruising on self. That's right. I can handle this. That's a foolish position to take in a battle. Uh -uh. When you know who the enemy is. So, the Second London Confession has a wonderful and, and excellent and a concise discussion of good works. We can't read all of it. But chapter 16 says, quote, Good works are only such as God hath commanded in his holy word, and not such as without the warrant thereof are devised by men. <clears throat> Out of blind zeal, men devised it. Out of blind zeal or upon any pretense of good intentions. In other words, Let's, let's get it down to where we live. People like to make laws for everybody else. They just do. They really do. And it might be a good intention. It might have a good uh, reason to think, uh, I need to bind everybody's conscience to what I'm thinking about this. That's why there is an immense importance in understanding the difference between preferences, opinions, and convictions. That's another, that's another study. But the fact is, we have to know what God commands us to, and we have to understand principles in the scripture to be able to apply to things that the Bible doesn't talk about. The Bible does not use the word abortion. It's not there. And so you hear things like this all the time. Here's what the Bible says about abortion. It never says anything with that word. But we do know that it teaches that murder is the violation of the fifth, sixth commandment. And we know that that is the intentional murder of a life that God has given. So we say, this is murder. There are plenty of things in the scripture like this where we have to take principles to look at something in front of us. There's not a, a, a verse that says the trans ideology. But there is many things, uh, there are lots of things in the scriptures that have to do with male, female, the separation between the two and the things they wear.
We have to study. We have to ask. We have to plead. We have to weep sometimes. We, I've had issues where I have walked into my bedroom and just dropped on my bed and wept. How do I understand this? How do I apply this? If I apply this the wrong way, I will be answering to you, O Lord, in the day of judgment. It does go on to say then, <clears throat> these good works done in obedience to God's commandments are the fruits and evidence of a true and lively faith. Our obedience does not save us. It will never save you. There's not one work you can do that will save you. But if God has saved us, we have a new heart. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the light of God's word. And we have the church that he's given us to walk according to the word of God. And we can. And for his glory, we must. Satan and the devils, they're too tough for me. Yeah, you're right. Good. That's glad you got that. But they're no match for Christ. Well, my sin, it just seems to wrestle me down. Mm -hmm. Good. You, you got that. It is greater and more powerful than you are. But Christ conquered. Otherwise, we don't have any hope. I say I'm going to heaven, but I'm still a prisoner of sin. That's what we're ultimately saying. No, you're not. I didn't just say you'll never sin again. We do. But there's a battle. And we should fight that battle by faith in Jesus Christ. We were challenged one year in Pastor Al Martin's pastor's conference to speak. Spend a year with John Owen in his volume six has to do with mortification of sin, the power of indwelling sin. And that was transformative because I realized how often I was just going, oops, did it again. So sorry. Next. Instead of saying, I am not going to let this thing rule me in the presence of my Lord. And that means there's going to be some fighting. And probably some tears. Praise the Lord. I'd rather be in the fight receiving wounds. Than to be sitting on the sidelines going. I know the Lord. But denying him. In my works. So. How do we do good works? In the power of the spirit. It's not our power. The power of the spirit. We do it by faith in Christ. And believing his word. You say, well, I, I believed and I'm still struggling. Good. Paul said the same thing. But keep struggling. Cast yourself on Christ and rest on his finished work. When you fail, it doesn't mean, oh, I'm lost. It means you failed. And we have a Savior who hung on Calvary's cross for those very failures. Look to him. And fight the battle and get up and go again. Well, number two, good works are the result of God's grace at work in our hearts. Let's make that even plainer. Good works are the result of God's grace at work in our hearts. Now, if you've been born of God's spirit, you know that it wasn't long after you, after the Lord convicted you of sin, brought you to believe the gospel, that you begin to notice at least a thing or two that you realize, you know, I probably shouldn't be doing that. I've always been comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with that anymore. At least something. I can't, I, I can't guess that for everybody. But I knew right away, boy, there was filth in my life and it had to go. There were attitudes in my life and I'm still fighting some of them, but I'm fighting them. I'm not saying, oh, it's okay, I'm saved by grace, no problem here. So, does this language of good works terrify you, child of God? Do you hear drudgery in it? Oh, no, I've got to be a poor, miserable Christian. 
Do you hear legalism here? Do you hear works mongering here? Is this oppressive, depressive, discouraging to you? If so, consider this. Good works are the fruit of God's work in you. Is that clear? Good works are God's works in you. He has given you the ability. He has given you the power through his spirit, enlightenment by his word to trust him and to war against those sins. Lord, help me. Help me to get my tongue under control in the way that I speak to my spouse or to my children or to my parents. This dishonors thee, Lord. Show forth thy conquering power in this heart. If you're not praying those things, are your problems continuing? Shouldn't be a surprise to you. But you see, we can rest in Jesus Christ. Every time, as I said earlier, I look at the Lord when we fail, look at that cross. He paid for this. Now, pray against that. We could go into more detail on that. We don't have time. Perhaps we'll do uh, uh, another series sometime with more practical aspects on mortification. But number one, God saves us by his grace to do good works. I used to live this way. I used to think this way. Anything that was generally considered good was because either my parents or somebody told me I had to do it and there would be consequences if I didn't. Right? You know, that's uh, maybe wise to do that, but it isn't necessarily holy. <laughs> it's just getting by. I'd sure like the keys of the car. Yes, ma'am. Right? We can put on a good act to get what we want, but that's not holiness. It's when we love Christ and just love him because he loved us. And therefore, we war against these things and we do these things with joy, not with grit teeth. Oh, I guess I'll just have to obey the Lord today. I can assure you it won't be a God-honoring day. Not going to happen. God saves us by his grace to do good works. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The good works don't save you. But they are the evidence that you've been saved. You love to do what he says because he saved your soul. Not to get something. Number two, God instructs us by his grace for good works. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Right now. I've been around you, Brother Jeff, sometimes uh, you're not so holy. You noticed. <clears throat> Every time I'm aware of it, I go after it. Sometimes you can be very unholy without even noticing, just in your attitudes. Guilty, but I have a Savior. And he's got a word that helps me to know how to start warring against that very thing pointed out. Number three, God informs us by grace of the knowledge of good works. He informs us by grace of the knowledge of good works. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Where is it? In here. You say, well, that's man of God. That's for elders. Exactly right. 
but why? Why is that for elders? So that you will live that way. That's the whole point. Outdo us. <laughs> Just out holy us. That, that would delight us. Understand what I'm saying. Love to see people climbing all over each other <laughs> to do great and glorious works for Christ. Number four, God works within us by grace to do good works. He works within us. You are not alone. God is not saying here, boom, perform. Oh, he didn't do so great today. This is not our God. He's teaching us every day. We're in his school. He wants us listening. And he wants us to know, okay, I knew about all your weaknesses, all your failures, and, failures, and all of the wicked things you were going to do. And many of them you did. But I gave my son to cleanse you. The father gave his son to cleanse us all for all our sins. Is this sinking in? You have to put these two things together. They have to walk together. I'm still fallible. Yes. But I have a Savior who has saved me. And out of love for him who gave his life, who shed his blood, the eternal son of God who became man so that he could die the most horrific death we could imagine. Why? For my bad tongue, my bad attitudes, my wicked acts. And they're paid for. That helps me get up the next day when I fail. I go to the cross regularly. So should you. But you see, that's the motive for doing what's right. He loves us. That's our last thought. Love for Christ is the biblical motive for all good works. Yes. We could do a whole sermon on that, but we're later than we usually are. But brethren, <clears throat> the, more, the more prayer meetings that we have like tonight... I mean, we may be coming to a day when all we're going to do on Wednesday is pray. If that's what we need to do. That's what we'll do. But keep praying. Keep praying. Don't stop praying. Not because the act itself does something, but because we're communing with the God who listens to us through Christ his son. Well, here's the last thing. Beloved children of God, Paul put the motivation of the Christian life this way. Faith that worketh by love. Everybody here knows this. Everybody can, you can memorize that. Faith which worketh by love. Faith which worketh by love. Believe him. Love him because he loved you. Can we read God's eternal love for us in Christ and not say with Christ, I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. That's what a that's what a born again heart says. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Can we hear that the eternal Son, the Word, was made flesh to live and die as our substitute and not love him? Can you hear about his sacrifice and not love him? Can we hear that Christ made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross and not love him? Who do you love? Who do you love more than that? Who could you possibly love more than that? Can we hear that he bear our sins in his own body on the tree? Every stinking, foul, hell-deserving sin. Every one of them. Every one of them. And not love him. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 
How can you not love him? How can I not love him? Can we hear that Jesus ascended far above all the heavens where he is seated at the Father's right hand, interceding for us until he comes again for us? And not love him. He's coming again. We're a day closer. How can we do that and not love him? How can we not love him? Knowing that he did all these things to save our immortal souls. He's interceding for us now. Holding some of you up as the hour grows late. And he is coming again. Well, I have more, but most of us don't have anything left for the evening. And I understand that. Let me just say this. Christ said, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them is he that loveth me. There's not one drop of legalism in that. Christ commanded. And he says, here's how you know. You love me and you walk according to my words. And his commandments are not. His commandments are not grievous. So let us love him supremely. And maintain good works that he ordained for us before the foundation of the world. You are able, by faith in Christ, being a new creature, by the power of the Holy Spirit, enlightened by the word of God, and loved by your brethren, to walk in a holy life. You can do it. Not because of anything natural to you but because of everything in the grace of Jesus Christ that makes us what we are. So, Paul commanded Titus to model good works and teach sound doctrine. By God's grace in Jesus Christ, may all pastors manifest a pattern of good works in their ministries so that God's people may do the same by faith in Christ for the glory of God. And brethren, as we look around this world, we can see that even men who stand in the pulpit and preach great sermons can fall and fall hard. <clears throat> Let us love one another keep ourselves accountable and pray for those who fall. It could be us next. May it never be. But if it is so, may we all be ready to do what Galatians tells us. <clears throat> if we see someone who has fallen, you that are Faithful, godly, holy. You who are new creatures. You who have learned something about fighting the battle. Draw near to them and encourage them. Help them along the way. <clears throat> Amen. Father, this is an important thought. Paul commanded Timothy to live in a way that authenticated his faith and that would communicate to God's people that they can walk that way. Help the elders of this church, whoever and whenever they are here, to be an encouragement to thy people in these things. Preserve them from falling. They're made of the same stuff as King David who fell greatly. Father, Help us in this day, not to look at others, but to look at our own hearts before thee and to learn how to mortify sin and do the good works thou hast called us to. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Have you ever heard a sermon and thought, that one's for me? I don't know how many other pastors are in the room, but that one was for me. And I pray that by God's grace, he will uphold and he will keep all of us in all the areas of responsibility that we have who take the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ into our lips and share it rightly with others, that our lives would so testify of that gospel we preach and commend it, that we would adorn the doctrine of Jesus Christ Amen. in all things. Amen. That we might be able to say with the Apostle Paul, he said, I didn't come to you in word only, but in power and demonstration of the Spirit. Amen. For you see, brethren, what manner of men we were among you for your sake. For in this sense, the gospel is not in word. The kingdom of God is not in word, but it's in power. Right. Power to live a holy life. Amen. Power to live a godly life. Power to leave an example that confronts and embarrasses the world and testifies of the true gospel of grace. Amen. May that grace be with us. May it be real. May it be real in our speech. And may it be real in our deeds. And with that, <clears throat> now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Lord bless you, dear saints. You're dismissed. Go in the grace of God.